All right, this is Bram Kanstein, and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. Together with my guests on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed, and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technology that you should understand and adopt. In this episode, I'm joined by Tim Niemeyer. He's a Bitcoin advocate and author who began his Bitcoin journey in 2018. As a former U.S. Air Force avionics technician, he brings a unique technological insight to the Bitcoin space. And he's also enriched by his educational background, holding a degree in psychology and having experience as an elementary teacher. His recently published book, History Echoes Bitcoin, connects historical parallels to the core properties of Bitcoin. And we are going to talk about that and more in this episode. Welcome, Tim. Thank you for having me, Brown. Thanks for coming on. I absolutely loved your book. Thanks for, for sending it to me. Uh, we already talked totally. off mic, but I think just the the angle that you chose already makes this like a great read for people and um you cut out yeah like how 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 did your book came about like why why did you write it how did that what's the story behind it i uh actually never intended to write a book um i was just enjoying being a shit poster on twitter like everybody else uh <laughs> And, and going through Bitcoin, I, I got to a point where I started to have those higher re uh, realizations. You know, you get the 21 million, you get the different, mm -hmm. the basic concepts. But then when you start putting all that together, um, you see things a different way. And once I had the idea for this book, it was just like, I kind of got to write it. I have to. And so what, what do you want people to take away from it? From this book, uh, that there are, have been arcs throughout history, basically on the properties that Bitcoin represents. So permissionlessness, gaining consensus, decentralization, trust minimization, censorship resistance, open source collaboration, immutability, and scarcity. Each one of those things throughout history has shown to be beneficial to society in their own way. And we see history yearning for all of these and they're all kind of coalescing in Bitcoin. And that's the overreaching takeaway I want people to start to see. That's, that's my realization that I had just yeah. a year or so ago. I love that you say that. Like it's, it's, uh, yesterday I had a recording um, uh, of, of a previous episode with, uh, with Mitchell Askew. And it's, it's so interesting that what you just said is very big right like all these things from history they are coming together in bitcoin and i think bitcoiners often talk like that but you know and and if you're if you're standing on the sideline and you're looking at this and then you could think like oh these guys are propping this up and they're talking like this but sure. the, 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 the realization the constant realization i almost want to say is that like a lot of these things are actually true and happening and so i feel that a lot of things that are said in the bitcoin space are not really opinions right they are just kind of like discoveries from research that different people did in different dimensions and from different point of views right it's like yeah this is just my conclusion it's not really well, an opinion and, and, almost. And, and you almost have to hyper focus on all these little things to, you know, the whole don't trust verify. Mm -hmm. You kind of got, got to do it on your own and zoom. But then the realization comes when you're able to zoom out and not have such that like hyper focus. And yeah. when you start to start to zoom out more, then you see how the, all these things come together. Yeah. Forest for the trees concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so how do you think you, you have a really diverse background, which, uh, uh, which I just mentioned, right? Like in, uh, in, in the Air Force, psychology, uh, music also, you're mm -hmm. an elementary teacher. Like how, how did this combination of all these experiences help you like approach, but eventually also understand Bitcoin? Well, let's add in farmer. Uh, my dad, okay. <laughs> my father's a farmer, a retired farmer now. Oh, cool. And I started out a few years farm on the farm hand and as a farm hand. And, uh, I was like, well, I could choose to do this, but I could also go choose to see the world, chose the air force, got to live in Japan for a couple of years, get a perspective there. I could have stayed in for 20 years, got a retirement, or I could have gone out and, um, got my, got my college paid for it. Thank you for paying your taxes. You know, mm. um, not you, but you know what I mean? <laughs> Um, so I did that and then I got into psychology and I was like, you know, want to help the world. So I, instead of talking smack, doing something about it. So education made sense. 
I like kids. I like teaching. So I tried that. And I've been a musician kind of throughout, a guitarist, you know, very average at best. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then just a few years ago, four or five years ago, I had the opportunity to become the elementary music teacher. So all grade levels. So it's, it's just one of those things of like, it's not so much getting bored with something, but it's like, ooh, a new opportunity. Let's try this. Hey, let's try that. And just try. It's the things that kept my interest. So that in doing that, that gave me a, the ability to see a lot of different perspectives. Like I said, my time in Japan, that was amazing. It was very eye-opening. Mm. We were talking before about like different cultures, and that was a culture I found so interesting, so fascinating, very respectful. Um, and, and it was more of that shock of like, hey, the, what I've seen, like, for example, like level of disrespect in culture, you know, it, it's different from yeah. culture to culture or level of respect, I guess you could say. And then being so respectful kind of shocked me to say, oh, there could be different ways of doing things. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Isn't it in Japan also that is, it's also about honor, right? Like when, um, I hope this example is right, but this always stuck with me that, um, you know, if someone starts a restaurant, for example, right? Like the honor, or like, like they promise that they will do their best and create the best restaurant that they can create, right? And if then they have bad reviews and or people don't like it then they just quit because that's their honor like they promised that they would do the best they could and if people didn't like it then they just quit even though it might be a good business or something exactly. uh, you know that honor is very high and uh so i don't know like i i hope this is true because i love it <laughs> as an example um but what's like the now that you're back for a lot of years already like what oh, yeah. what what do you think about america now that's a very big question what do i think oh, about america as a country but like how is it going <laughs> now uh, also uh, let's combine it with you know what, yeah, what uh, yeah, just contrast. like the whole the whole yeah. bitcoin point of view also right like i think bitcoin once you go into that it opens your mind as well and you find like other topics that you never looked at before you know so i think it gives yeah, you it, like a critical new viewpoint absolutely sense. and and going back to like looking for new opportunities as you go along, Bitcoin kind of just fell in my lap and it gave me even more perspective. And in terms of like societally, like the one thing I see now that I just can't unsee is time preference and mm. its effects on society. And I'm sure that's not just in, in America. You know what I mean? It's kind of everywhere. The, the high time preference mindset, which we believe is brought on, through you know inflation or the effects of inflation Mm -hmm. uh to see society so immediate needs like poverty mindset um like i need this right now as opposed to the uh, i'm going to sell my chairs concept of uh, (laughs) living for bitcoin you know know, there's such a stark contrast the people who listened to the previous episode will hear uh, again i talked to mitchell he's 23 he showed me his his office is a desk a chair and a computer and his bedroom is is uh a bed one bed <laughs> and he has one chair in his living room he's literally doing what you just said, uh, what you both, just said. we yeah. both have plants in our background we're living the high life i guess yeah 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 i think so <laughs> not true bitcoiners you know sell yeah, your yeah. plants well, but it's interesting. This it's also people are kind of like unknowingly forced into this short time preference lifestyle, almost right. A, oh yeah. And and I don't think it's only with in in like from a consumerism angle or that people want things when they want it, but it's also in in discourse, right? Like it, it's like yes or no, good or bad. You know, like people don't really think about. I don't know, like two opposing um, arguments can be uh, both be true, right? Uh, or both be bad or not true. That's and so like critical, I, I, critical sk- thinking skills right there. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And so I find it difficult to see that uh, people act really engaged or virtuous, but they are doing that on the basis of information that's just been shoved down their throat, basically. And they doesn't seem that they actually did that work sometimes. Did, I, 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 you're considerably younger than I. Um, do, can you remember yourself pre 
uh, Bitcoin because I know I can and I, yes, I know total I, I oblivious. live oblivious and I lived a lot of that high time preference lifestyle. Yes, you look yes, back and you're yes. just like, holy well, I have 20 pairs of sneakers and now I don't buy sneakers <laughs> anymore. No, but it's like that. It's uh, I, I, I said this in a previous episode and also one of the reasons why I, I focus on millennials. Like I was 30 and working at a bank. I had a mortgage and then a colleague was like, and I was already into Bitcoin. So that was like a weird thing. And a colleague said, did, did you know that money in the bank is not yours? And I said, well, sorry, what? <laughs> what yeah. do you mean? And then he explained to me and then I just felt like an idiot. I was like, I'm participating in something that I totally do not understand how it works right and and it's i think less about fully understanding how it works but going from zero understanding to a very important understanding that the money in the bank is not yours was just a really big shocker and as you just asked me like the time before bitcoin really clicked you know after a few times yeah i i honestly think like where was i like what was i thinking like maybe i was lucky that i was in a safe western country that i didn't die along the way right like sometimes that's really how i feel like yeah. where was my mind like where was i at was i even paying attention or was i just lucky yeah like am i lucky that i'm still alive or something like maybe, maybe that's too big but sometimes i really i, I get think about it like that well um your uh listenership might not understand this concept but i used to have like CDs. Did you guys? Did you have like? Yeah, a CD? of course. Dude, I I'm had... 36. Okay, <laughs> I okay. Had CDs. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Uh, I, you know, I'm going on 46 this month, so. Okay, okay. Uh, well, but I, well, had, I had CDs too. I had so many, like, like jazz and blues and funk and just all types of genres, just ba boxes and boxes of them, and I can't find them now. My mom might have thrown them away. I don't know. Hmm. But yeah, <laughs> it's like all the money and time. Now it's music, and that filled my soul. Don't get me wrong, but uh, just the idea of just buying, 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 buying. Just yeah. consumerism. Consumerism yeah. is a big part of this whole thing. Yeah. Well, maybe this is a nice jump to to sure. the things that you talk about in the book, because um, I've talked a lot about kind of like philosophical angle on Bitcoin in this podcast. But I like that you in in your book, like you touch upon ethical considerations for bitcoin like can you can you explain a bit about that give me an example of what you're talking when you say ethical you're talking more like that that how a society could improve um with the changes that okay. that bitcoin can bring and how or well, maybe it's also kind of connects to what we just talked about like this well, the the information asymmetry also, right? For, well, let's, for let's focus on like one aspect, one property of Bitcoin, right? Yeah. Um, I have a few I want to talk about. Okay. We could take per permissionless. Take, take permissionlessness. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you draw in, in the book, there's a comparison uh, between like the less permissioned <laughs> South Korea and then North Korea. Right. Where you kind of like illustrate, uh, yeah, a permissionless system versus you have to have permission. I put that in there and that's one of the few like it wasn't like a historical event it was just more of like a, a snapshot yeah. a comparison uh but what are the results of living a permissioned versus a permissionless uh, lifestyle and for those of you guys who know north korea it is going to be the more permissioned side the more authoritarian side um simple things like travel like if you want to travel you know um one a, a terminal airport uh and you can only go to two places you can go to china or somewhere else <laughs> russia um, maybe i don't know I want, I want basically to uh, yeah. south korea it's going to be more freedom laden uh the education is better the food is better uh the ability to own your own house is better uh, it, you, the list goes on and on. You can have a passport to and get, travel anywhere in the world. It, it, it just uh, permissionlessness breeds freedom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like freedom and, to participate in in the systems, right? In, the in, in, systems. in any systems, and yeah. but that e freedom in economic system frees up the ability in social systems and you know relationships in so many different. Uh, factors of life so the opposite of permission is per or permissionlessness is permissioned and the opposite of freedom is what so um just in that concept right there uh comparison of korea is it 
the ethical stance, you know, is that we should be aiming for permissionlessness. And yeah. how can we do that? Our current system, our current financial system controls our ability to conduct ourselves freely because of all of the controls that we have currently on money because the small few the percentage of people with power that they're able to control that system and gain more power and they do that through a permission system yeah well it's Whereas, even down down to the level of if if you call your bank and say i want to get i don't know maybe 10k cash they will ask you questions right so there's, there's no there's no freedom to get what you own in a it's sense. Not your money in the bank, and there is no money in the bank. So, like you said, oh, yeah. No, but is that that is you know if we look at the application of Bitcoin, the the permissionlessness versus a, the a permission system, right? Where yes, you have to call the bank to get money from a certain amount, and they will ask you what you're gonna use it for, and well, if they deem that not good enough or not the good enough explanation then perhaps you're not getting the money right like that that really but, ethically that goes against your individual well, freedom it, and yeah they the banks are basically the you know financial watchdog you know part of the uh political system now they can just why would they ask you that in the first place because they want to know and if they want to know they get to choose whether that's okay or not hmm. so yeah there's these videos of this guy, I think it's in Australia, and he just walks into the bank and he says, I want to draw like, I don't know, 10 or 20,000 uh, like Australian dollars from my account. And then they say, okay, what, what do you want to use it for? And he just gives them like crazy reasons, like stu the stupidest reasons ever. And then, and then you see these people, they are just doing their job, obviously, but that's also yeah. part of the problem in a sense. You know, if we think back about how oblivious were we, you know, like everyone needs a job, everyone needs a roof, everyone needs food, right? So those those are like the first things that you focus on. But then when you are like at the outskirts of the system that is preventing other people from having their personal freedom, right? Like accessing the wealth or the, the money energy that they that they gather that's in the bank. Like you you don't you know, these people also don't know what they are. Um contributing to of course but it's just really interesting that he asks them then like why do you want to know and then they say yeah that's just our protocol and like they don't there's of course not really a discussion but it's just interesting to see how people just operate without i want to say like all the information or enough information or, or something like it's uh yeah and that kind of goes back to that perspective we were talking earlier and that how, how um, the scope of what you're looking at, because, mm. yeah, you got to zoom in on certain parts to understand, you know, the inner workings, but you don't gain that until you zoom out. And, and to me, in a way, the zooming in is that high time preference is a result of being a high time preference mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and if the people at the counter would zoom out and maybe ask like themselves, like, why am I asking this person what they want to do with their own money? Maybe that's already a little threat for them to explore further, to try and figure out like, what, what am I actually? If there's some cogn yeah. cognitive dissonance going on there. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. You, you always, you always <laughs> yeah. wonder. Yeah. 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 Um, Another another um, aspect that you touch is, is decentralization. You mentioned the quote, centralization as a system is inconsistent with a non-violent structure of society. How does the principle of decentralization in Bitcoin contribute to a non-violent uh, societal structure? Like what's, what's well, the difference here? One, one, one thing I learned uh, about a lot of, uh, when, in researching these books is there's a lot of crossover. So the permissionlessness is, the permission system is able to succeed because it is centralized, right? Because hmm. there's that, yeah. it, not only is there a single point of failure, there's a, one entry point, you know. Uh, what did uh, George Carlin say? It's like, it's a big club and you ain't and in you're it. You're not in it, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> That's they a have good that, bit. <laughs> right? Oh, it's yeah. great, right? Um, yeah. But decentralization, if you can actually implement it, you know, without fail, it, stops the whole permissionlessness 
Mm. Now, if, if uh, we have the optionality to choose. So if you and I wanted to do business and our bank said no, we could go say, you know, piss off yep. bank and we can work together. That's decentralization in action on the small scale. Yeah, they have a force over us because they are the only ones who control the access, right? And so when it's decentralized, it's kind of like the other way around. Like you can only play if you follow the rules uh, as, as the, um, how would you say that, like the enabler of what is happening w with the money in that network, right? So it kind of turns it around. Are you are are you a sports guy? Do you is there a certain sport you like? I want to say I golf, but I don't know if that helps your example. No, that analogy is just doesn't make sense at all. Well, no. you know, I mean, but like, so I'm a baseball guy. Mm -hmm. uh, my son's ten. He's loving baseball and growing up, so I'm coaching it and just loving cool. it all over again. Uh, imagine if we're playing baseball, and my team against your team and I am not only the player, not only the coach, the manager, but I'm also the umpire mm -hmm. <laughs> and the yeah. rule maker and the scorekeeper. And I can change any one of those aspects to benefit myself. Now you would hope somebody with upstanding, you know, moral structure would not, but that's just not the world we live in. You know, people are um, make decisions based on incentives. It's an incentive-based world. So if you have the ability in a game to make all those changes, you got to think yeah. a certain Someone amount will do of the that. population is, population is going to do that, right? Yeah. And decentralization keeps that from happening. It keeps that ability to per make permissions, keeps that in check. Yeah. Well, and you can try to mess around with it, but then you are just rejected by... And they find out, yeah, yeah, by the network, right? Yeah, so it's it's also less less obscurity in a sense, right? Because you have to follow uh, the rules that the, the the decentralized group agree to, and once right. you don't, then yeah, you cannot just participate anymore. All right, and and, and to tie that back into what you mentioned about like the the the, the violence and non-violence is basically. Mm. You know, is that about like well, a state having a monopoly on violence or, or what do you mean? With control, like how, uh, how is it enforced? Obviously, Bitcoin is enforced mm. through energy, right? Proof of work. Where, how is the fiat system enforced? Eventually, and this is not to get too like fire and brimstone, but eventually it comes down to force. If you don't pay your taxes, what are they going to do? You know, they'll yeah. come and get you. If you, mm. you know, if you don't follow their rules, they will apply force. So to me, that's violence. <laughs> yeah. And, and a nonviolent society is, is basically a, a voluntary society. Where but you're can, also depending more on the others in the society. Well, right? because and, and the and others that, also. And, and, you know, we said humans are, uh, make decisions based off incentives. So in a, in a voluntary society, the, it, the incentive is to act well, yes. be good to one another, yes. because it, it reciprocates. In a permission mm -hmm. society, in, in that centralized society, that violent society, we're all just kind of like, this is where actually I think politics comes into play. We're all yeah. just fighting for that control so I can change the rules to make you do what I say. So well, I can exactly, yeah. So to not be dependent anymore on whoever is in charge, right? right. And in, decentralized, in the decentralized manner, you are all in charge. So you are dependent. Everyone is dependent on the other. It's not like mm. one party is dependent on the other, right? I think, um, I want to say it right. I think like the perfect um, uh, like size for uh, like, a, like a a, a a barter society, like a localized society where, where mm. this is optimized. I think it's 150 or 250 people. I've heard that. Uh, Dunbar like, number. The Dunbar yeah, so number. Yeah. I think it's 250. 250 um, sounds right. So where everyone contributes their own thing and they are all dependent on each other. There is no, well, maybe there's an elder or something, but they are not the central ruler that controls what everyone uh, needs to do, right? And there is only like one sentence for not doing your part. It's that you're kicked out of the group, basically. 
so the, the the social cohesion and everyone doing their part right like if you get the food in the in the jungle and you come back home and there uh, and and the dinner is made by someone else and someone else fix fix the hole in your roof you know then you all contributed to you know that 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 group in a sense cut now but there you are all the people know that once they do they not they don't do their little part they can be exiled from the group and that's just that's that's just the only rule, right? So even if you try to mess around, other people will just you know hold you up against uh, th that, that rule. That reminds me of uh, one of the things I wrote about uh, the Grand Grand Council of Six Nations, mm -hmm. so Northeast American uh, Native Americans uh, before the United States became a country. Uh, they were six different tribes. And they basically followed the simple idea that we're going to protect each other from foreign invaders, but we're also going to let each other make our own rules. We're all, you know, I don't tell you what to do. You don't tell me what to do. But hey, if we're getting attacked, let's back each other. Yeah. That's about as simple as you can get. In fact, the United States, uh, Ben Franklin brought them in to say, this should be a model of our constitution. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, the Dunbar number, by the way, is 150. It is 150, okay. Yes, and it's the amount of also social relations that, that yes. you can have. Right, um, which supports the Grand Council, yeah. which supports localism, and, and in a way, Bitcoin allows for localism on a global scale, as opposed to the whole centralization you know, uh, model of like one global political you know, order, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, we're allowed to just interact freely. Crazy thought. Yeah. Well, the the ne the next uh, one I wanted to talk about is about trust minimization, right? So the the trustlessness of Bitcoin, which you know the permissionlessness is about. No one has to give you um, access to participate, right? Like anyone can participate, and the trustlessness is about you don't have to trust anyone, any person, which <laughs> Is a, is a good thing, right? And you use, I thought it was a really cool example. You use, you use like the Navajo code talkers in, in World yeah. War II. And that was like a method of trust um, minimization. And in Bitcoin, it's kind of used in a similar way. Why is this, why do you see this as, as crucial to, to Bitcoin? And, and why did you chose this, this example? I'm trying to remember back to that. So, like I was saying earlier, the arc of history, trying to move towards all of these different properties, simultaneously mm -hmm. speaking, trust is easily broken. And it has been repeatedly throughout history, right? So, what it, I chose this example to kind of like illustrate, hey, it's early cryptography, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people... Uh, outside of Bitcoin here. You know, the cryptography, they think crypto or cryptocurrency, and it's got a completely different definition, but cryptography in and of itself is just language, right? It's just math and code, right? Yeah. So uh, the Navajo Indians basically were able to translate during the war uh, into their own language, which was completely different than any other language at the time. So it was basically unbreakable. Yeah, it was used as a as a as a, as a way to send message. messages, right? Especially, I think in the in the Pacific uh, activity of the U.S. Oh, right? World in War the, Two, right? World War Two, yeah, yeah. So, uh, just having that component. You see, the thing about Bitcoin to me is it, it each and of each and of them in and of themselves are necessary, but the magic sauce, the sweet sauce, is where everything actually is put together and works together mm. you can't have one without the other yeah and that's kind of what we discovered over the last you know altcoin cycle yeah or well, two that's or the whatever. discovery that is bitcoin right the the discovery. Com like the combination of all these aspects working together basically I, i've been fighting back and forth like to really understand the whole is it a discovery is it an invention thing and yeah because that's that's not very intuitive intuitive and most people you know kind of just I don't know, yeah. but I, I'm leaning more and basically, and like on what you said, it is a discovery because like inventions, you can invent more things and put more bells and whistles on. Yeah. 
It's about the, the combination of uh, it is. It's like the accidental discovery of penicillin or LSD or you know, like like Two these things, things were right? also <laughs> accident. Yeah, accidental. Um, well, this is this was on purpose, but it's a discovery. I think the engineering part in Bitcoin is about that Satoshi figured out how all these things fit together to actually provide, you know, what uh, um, what he wanted to create. There's, imagine, the, uh, yeah. yeah, imagine Satoshi's low time preference and his ability to zoom out to see how all those parts and pieces fit together. Because I agree that that was his like. There was he 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 added a few thing, uh, components that were very necessary that had yet to be implemented. Yeah. But just that ability to zoom out and say, "I need every single one of these in order for the whole thing to work." That yeah. that's the brilliance right there. And also that these inventions uh, were spread out over uh, over a pretty large time frame. Forty, as fifty well. years, something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so. The trustlessness in Bitcoin, I, I find this a really interesting word, actually, right? Because it, it ties into what you just said and uh, talked about this in the last episode as well, right? Like any proposed system that is potentially corruptible will be corrupted by someone who wants to do that, right? Even if you think I would never do that, if I were in that position, like you, you, you know, it's going to happen. The incentives and, matter. I, I, like, yeah. I, I like to say... Um, you know how everybody says Bitcoin fixes this? And I've said that many times myself. Yeah. I, I tend to lean more now to Bitcoin incentivizes this because it's a system yeah. in place and people act differently based on different incentives and, and the incentives are aligned in this system. So why wouldn't you want to adopt it? Yeah, it gives you very like a great rationale, I think, to also compare to like current system um and and like a possible future system right like if you want to move towards bitcoin because what you just said about um or what we talked about like the the, the teller at a bank who asks you a question about yeah. like why are you using this money um she's she's like on the permission part but you have to trust that that policy came from somewhere um that is um well, helpful to a citizen like you, right? You have to trust that that was created um, for a good uh, cause, basically. And what is and that? You don't even have the choice, I wanted to add. You don't have the well, choice to trust them. You just have to follow along, basically. But that leads to, uh, like, if you think like brain science and psychology, when you turn that skill off of, like, that analytical skill of, is this good or is this bad or, or whatever, you're also not flexing that muscles so to speak right mm -hmm. so yeah. it kind of uh, dumbs us down over time if we're not thinking critically about all of these different decisions uh, so the the trust model in in that regard where you don't even have the choice to think so i'm not going to think about that it leads to yeah you don't even see the of problem that area. right you don't yeah exactly yeah it's like it's just it's just the way it is but that's also why i think that actually when you think about the trustlessness of bitcoin what um so the trustlessness in Bitcoin basically is you don't have to trust any other person. The only things, two things I think you need to trust are the, the protocol. So if you understand what the protocol is, you know, the code that just, you know, just is and just will work until forever, basically. Yeah. That's the only thing you have to trust, trust the code. And I think the second thing is like you have to trust yourself that you're capable of, you know, um, keeping your own wealth in your custody and all these things. Like I, I talk to a lot of people about Bitcoin and this is like one of the things that they find really hard is that you, the whole self custody thing, right? Like if I have X amount in Bitcoin, Oh wow. I'm fully responsible. Yes. I'm f you're fully responsible. I don't, uh, there's no one else coming to save me. No, there's no one else coming to save me, which implies there's also no forced trust, but you have to be able to trust in yourself that you will be diligent enough. Right, which, which forces you into a growth mindset and going back to that, you're, the reason you're feeling mm -hmm. that fear is because that part of your brain is not, hasn't been flexed in a while or in that way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You just didn't, didn't. And, and you may not have yeah. the confidence in yourself to be like, I can do this. And yeah. after you do it for a while, it's like, that's not so bad. You know? Well, I think it, for most, most people, it's probably more scary to trust themselves than to mm. 
uh, give give away that <laughs> that responsibility to to be to being taken care of, basically. Absolutely. Right? So yeah. Um, next thing was censorship resistance, and when you talk about censorship resistance, you you talk about the trial and execution of Socrates, which was a long time ago. Yeah. But as you discussed, right, like his ideas uh, didn't really. Uh, um, uh, um, you got canceled. You say like yeah, got canceled. <laughs> well, in, in, in the realest way possible, right? right. Um, and, and this was censorship by the state. Is basically how you how you illustrate it. How does the censorship resistance of of Bitcoin counteract a centralized control that you know we just we just talked about? So uh, yeah, this book is full of examples and non-examples, and to me, this would be the non-example. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Where that central authority is able to censor. Um, the the consensus was overridden by the few in the room. Um, and all he was trying to do was just share his thoughts, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that we still think about today, by the way. Yeah, yeah, the thoughts we all have and should yeah. or should have, right? Mm -hmm. So that time was not censored. Uh, there, he was not resistant to censorship. So that's just kind of speaking to, hey, throughout history, you know, we kind of needed that. This guy who was really smart and helped a lot of people have a lot of new and better thoughts. Yeah. He was able to get censored. Why shouldn't we have a system that doesn't allow that? And it, the censorship resistance comes from the decentralization, right? Mm. Because if... Again, like but if once it's published, it's published. <laughs> it's published. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. matter my take on it, which mm. it, it, it just sets it g gives a basis for reality as opposed to uh, spin or propaganda. Like if yeah. I can control the channels, I can tell you what to think and how to think. And it, enough times of hearing that, you're more likely going to kind of be sympathetic to sympathetic to it at least, right? Yeah, yeah. But like you said, if we're able to broadcast that uh, and everybody has this shared understanding of just the very simple truth, then it's hard to be like, well, this guy over here who's shouting, he's saying something different. Oh, I feel, I feel, I <laughs> feel like feel. it's not. <laughs> Give me your I feel statement, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I think this is, this one I find like really co uh, illustrating and also correlating to like current times, right? Like it's. The, the like freedom of expression uh, and and action is really countered with this like cancel culture where I think you know this example of Socrates we still people still talk about Socrates they still talk about you know the the thoughts that he shared or the mental models and stuff like that and so he was actually right you know like yeah the, the fact the fact or well profoundly more right than whoever executed him, right? And, Do we have and, to talk? Yeah. And the irony of that is that despite all their best intentions, uh, his his thoughts still live on and he lives yeah. on. So uh, over time, the truth won out. And yeah, well, you know. we also still talk about the Greeks, right? <laughs> but yeah. it's, it's uh, I, I find cancellation like one of the weakest, it's the weakest form of any... I want to say dialogue, but it's not even a dialogue. But it's about like where where did we take this exit, where we can't just discuss ideas, right? Like if you operate from kind of like first first principle or like a mental model of uh, I know that I don't know everything, then whatever you think could also be interesting for me to learn about, right? I don't have to agree, and you don't have to agree with me. But maybe both of our ideas are good or bad, right? Like, why, why, why did we take that exit? And the Bitcoiner answer would probably be like fiat money, maybe. Yeah. But yeah, I, I do feel that the money is kind of like also one of the base layers of interaction between people, right? We yeah. are exchanging value and exchanging ideas is also exchanging value. So in some way, I don't want to say I know the uh, exact cause, but I feel like that is definitely part of it. Just the ability to to exchange information and value with each other is yeah, corrupted, I'd say. And this is like one of the examples. 
of that. It's not facts, it's more feelings, right? And the feelings are legitimized and then is, someone is canceled. Well, in Socrates' time, he was actually killed. Um, yeah, yeah. Facts, facts are like a, a raft on a raging ocean where, you know, you have the truth that's just s sitting there like a battleship. You know, it's, it's not going to be deterred. Mm -hmm. well, I think it's also interesting that when you dive into Bitcoin, it's like, like I said in the beginning, and the, a lot of things people in Bitcoin say, they feel like opinions, but they're just kind of like objective realizations or observations right like i don't there is opinions obviously in this space but sure sometimes i hear myself say things about bitcoin where i think like oh that sounds so ridiculous sounds such like a like a hype type statement right or a shill uh for bitcoin but that is actually then not the case it's just my own realization of something that i deeply studied or, and, you know? and you mentioned first principles and one of the guys that really uh, bore that into my head was Jeff Booth, your one of your mm. previous guests, which that was a great episode. I, I just did love that episode. Um, but but speaking from first principles, yeah, it's like okay, you can say you don't like that, but you can't disagree with it. Doesn't it. change the fact. And, <laughs> right? and and if you can't disagree with it, then what is your one of your only other tools is to cancel it, you know, to try and censor it. Mm -hmm. It's like, and like you said, that's weak. That's beta. That's you know, we can do better than canceling each other's thoughts it's like come at me with reason and logic but why do we accept or why 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 is it accepted why is cancellation accepted currently what, what do you think about that um it, uh, again an incentive of the fiat system because the high time preference mindset is like oh i'm i'm feeling discomfort from this current situation of cognitive dissonance <laughs> so instead of like putting in the proof of work to argue it or think it through or change my mind, it's easier to just turn it off or swipe, you know? Yeah. I don't want to do the work to understand why this objective truth messes me up so much inside. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Funny. I, I, I feel that, that people who really like dove into Bitcoin, they understand this proof of work thing that you have to. I, I also have the same feeling as sometimes people have opinions and then and, and I think like, but how substantiated is this opinion? Like, did you do enough work to form this opinion, right? And I really try to operate from a point where I, I want to know enough and that's my own quality like bar, right? Like how much work I do, but I want to know enough before I have an opinion because it's just, oh gosh, it's also a disingenuous conversation, right? If I have an opinion about something that you I don't know, studied for 10 years. It's like, I'm not even respecting your time or intelligence or whatever. If when I'm not able to just, I could, I couldn't you know, tell you yeah. who, who the best golfer is. So I'm not even going to try. I have no clue either. <laughs> oh, I thought, I thought you were a golfer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I'm a golfer. I don't follow it, but I find, yeah, oh, that's great. this is just, I could talk about this for a long time, but it's uh, yeah. Interesting. Um, last one I wanted to touch upon. Uh, fr from the book was the, the scarcity aspect. Like you reflect on how video games with unlimited lives influence your behavior due to like a lack of scarcity, right? Like, uh, I don't know, I played uh, Grand Theft Auto also when I was younger. Like, oh, oh yeah. I can just do this crazy thing or I could just die there and I spawn again, right? So I, I thought it was like a nice, nice example. But you draw a parallel to the real world concept of, of scarcity, like, can you explain this analogy <laughs> that you used here? Um, so, uh, yeah, to me, that's also a, uh, a, an incentive kind of thing, right? It's an incentive of the system. Like, I'm going to run balls to the wall into, you know, Super Mario. I'm going to just run and jump. I'm going to get that eventually, but, you know, I'm going to die in the process, and it doesn't matter because I'm going to keep going. So yeah. as if it was a different now video game probably wouldn't be played if it only had one life, right? <laughs> if you had one life and you're done, there nobody would play the video game. But uh, yeah, scarcity changes how you act. Um, it's a Jeff Booth quote. It makes you more know, cautious, oh, or you have to think, right? Abundance lead, uh, abundance in uh, resources leads to scarcity elsewhere. Scarcity in resource, you know, that concept mm -hmm. right there, it is huge. So. Uh, well, abundance um, takes away boundaries, I'd say, right? And boundaries are very important for 
making a plan, being creative, um, analyzing, you know, possible strategies, etc. So if if you can do anything, you want, it's kind of like, I think this is one of kind of like the millennial tenets, right? Like we could always do anything. So we, we get like, uh, um, it's a paradox of choice also, uh, in, in a sense, right? That analysis that, paralysis. <laughs> yeah. I can do anything. What should I do? Oh, I don't know. Or I try everything and I have no direction, right? I think it's, uh, it, it's, it, it has to do with that, that scarcity forces you to think within the frame of the scarcity that is given to you, whether that's 21 million Bitcoin or a certain amount of time or whatever. Um, well, yeah. and the scarcity also it, it is about respect and respecting time and effort, you know. So when we print millions and millions, we create inflation and each unit in the system is worth less and less. And if you're working for those units and the current system is set up to devalue that, it's basically devaluing your time and effort. And that's disrespectful. Mm -hmm. I take offense to that. I mean, <laughs> well, and that's I just... one of the main reasons I love Bitcoin is because <laughs> it's respecting my time and effort. Yeah. I saw just, I saw a tweet. The US Defense Department has failed its financial audit for the sixth consecutive year. Well, this is a prime example. Surprise, probably, right? Like, surprise it, face. It, it, if you didn't have to do it after three years, then, well, probably also not after four and five and six. So there are, I think there's a prime example of no boundaries. It's, um, uh, that, yeah. that kind of reminds me of the phrase, like, if you're talking to a banker, um, if I owe the bank $1,000, that's my problem. If I owe the bank a million dollars, it's their problem. You know, once it gets so big, <laughs> well, it doesn't matter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, man. I think. It's it is hard for people to find a thread, let a, let alone more threads to start pulling from, right? To learn and also when I look back at my own journey, I find it hard to really say like, oh, that's when it clicked, or that's when I really saw something that I couldn't unseen before. Like, how how is that for you? Like, are there specific things that triggered you, or well, was it like a slow? I was journey? actually I started to buy in and study in the middle of 2018, which was after the last big peak of 2017, it came down and kind of flattened out. And like I bought the week before it went from like 6,000 down to 3,000. So I, I, I learned real quick. I'm like, what the hell? Man? Um, and I, but I kept learning it because it was interesting and I like to geek out on stuff and it was, you know, a new opportunity. So, and then, the, and I always been about like libertarian leaning decentralization anyway mm. so that kind of clicked there but the real eye-opening was 2020 and, and that crash and everything that ensued regardless of politics or anything else it was just like holy shit uh all of these properties that we we've been discussing or most of these properties uh just got flipped on their head and they were mm -hmm. already on that trajectory you know the scarcity money printing well look at all the money we spent there uh, the centralization. Well, now we're taking control of all aspects of your life, whether it was a good cause or not. I don't even, that's irrelevant to, mm. this, to this discussion. Um, the ability to gain consensus. We can't even agree with sciences, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and it's all based on, uh, it, it's all based on that, that truth feeling aspect we had before. There was a lot of fear. Um, we didn't have permissions, uh, you know, uh, we couldn't see information uh being changed through laws so it wasn't open source you know like all of these concepts in bitcoin were being challenged and bitcoin was resilient through the whole thing and not only resilient it it, it was anti-fragile you know it, it got stronger yeah. yeah and uh that that gave gave me hope that gave me you know peace of mind where everybody else is flipping out i i kind of had something to hold on to to be like this all makes sense this is all yeah this thing doesn't change Logic. it doesn't care it, it, right mm -hmm. it's staying so, I, strong through the storm i think that's actually a very strong realization that when the, name anything else <laughs> that doesn't care <laughs> well nature nature maybe honey badgers nature, maybe. Nature, i don't know yeah yeah honey badgers too but no like nature doesn't care about what we do like nature will always survive in a sense even when we but when we die out, nature will always survive. Um, and I, I think 
when you have that insight into Bitcoin, it's interesting also when like a price really goes down and you think like, oh, what happened? Did it like crash or like did Bitcoin, the technology crash or did something change or a hack or whatever? Like, no, nothing changed. It's all purely the human psychology. The asymmetry of information and all that. Yeah, exactly. But it's the, the thing, the basics, the fundamentals have not changed. It's still the same. You can read about what has actually changed if there's something changed to the core, right? But mostly it's just chugging along. <laughs> it's just there. You know, I think that gives me personally a lot of uh, rest. Like, like uh, I'm, I'm a pretty risk averse person. That's actually why I Bitcoin. Like I don't have to worry about all this external influence and all these people trying to mess with whatever other system I could be involved in. And for me, it's just like, I know this, it, it'll just keep doing its thing. That actually gives me a lot of peace. I love that. So, what? What of the? We we talked about a few aspects. You mentioned others before. Like, which which of the aspects of Bitcoin do you think has like the biggest potential impact, or is it more like what you mentioned before, yeah. like that that combination that you know it's they the, strengthen each other? It's the confluence. It, it's the secrets. It, it, the mix. You know, it's it, it's all of them working in tandem in concert is what makes it. Uh, the discovery that it is yeah and so what's the biggest misconception you think people have about bitcoin or what what's like the biggest one that you run into i don't even think it's misconception i think it's lack of conception (laughs) you know what i mean yeah (laughs) i mean there's a lot of fun out there for sure but it's like so i i started uh just because i like to geek out about bitcoin i started making like youtube shorts and stuff Mm -hmm. about bitcoin education and i was sitting in my son's jujitsu uh lesson and I just finished one and I leaned over to somebody who I've known, you know, since high school and I was like, told her what's going on. I was like, Hey, can you take a look at this? And it was on scarcity. And I was like, you know, what's your takeaway from it? And she said, uh, I didn't know there was a limited supply. Hmm. Okay. So we get so, uh, Bitcoiners get so deep down the rabbit hole that we can't even see out and see how people are walking around, you know, uh, not with, without it, even like the slightest understanding. Very interesting. So I could, I could imagine I could have that conversation with her on every other one of these properties, right? And yeah. I'd have to do them separately just to even like crack the surface, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what are you doing with the YouTube shorts? Trying to, to <laughs> yeah. make it simpler then? Or like yeah. say there's only 21 million? Like what, no, what's your goal there? Uh, so here's a fun one. Uh, a study from like at least 10 years ago uh, analyzed the uh speech pattern or the, the difficulty of um like text complexity in presidential speeches throughout the decades and what they noticed was uh it went from a collegiate level decades ago you want to guess what uh the reading level is now for <laughs> i don't know seventh grade or something. fifth grade and that was oh in 20 <laughs> that was in 2014 so i i hate to see what it is now so well now it's like <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's yelling and screaming and beating their chest, right? <laughs> yeah. So my my thing is like I'm I'm an elementary c- teacher. You, I, I've been doing that for almost 20 years. It's like you got to find uh, the frequency at which they can receive, mm-hmm. right? So I'm I, I'm going to be making shorts. They're going to be more for the uh, no coiner, I guess you could say. Um, and I'm going to make it not to disrespect anybody's intelligence, but I'm just going to make it bite-sized chunks easier to understand so i i think that's like you know you get into conversations you want i want to talk about the consensus algorithm and they're like what <laughs> i don't know what either of those words mean so um i'm kind of trying to take my education background and my bitcoin knowledge and put to put it toward there that's the that's the uh orange pill i'm going for yeah great a great angle like i th- i think there's there's still so much to do right so um there's so many opportunities when also for people who listen listen to this like if you're enthusiastic about bitcoin you can yeah i I started a podcast you are going to do youtube shorts like you can do anything to contribute and and help people right and as you mentioned like you you cannot expect that everyone that you potentially talk to knows the basics like the fixed supply (laughs) right and there's just so much to win. So, um, yeah, I love that. Did you actually start with it yet? Yeah. Or are yeah, you going I'm, to? I'm going with uh, Zoom Out. 
so you can it's zoom out 21 on uh twitter uh youtube instagram awesome. uh, not instagram but whatever I'll, I'll link to all of them in the yeah, in the yeah, show yeah. notes so pe- um, people can check it out yeah and also i'd say for your listeners go to uh, local meetups I, I co-host lincoln land bitcoin meetup in springfield illinois which is in the middle of a cornfield so i doubt your listeners cool. are gonna show up there but yeah if, if there are no local meetups start your local meetup you know yeah there's an opportunity yeah, right there 100 percent agree so what's what's like a personal story that highlights the the impact of bitcoin on, on your life is that yeah well is the meetup one of those things or oh yeah what? no absolutely I, I'm, I'm more of an introvert uh historically speaking or i guess pre-bitcoin uh so putting myself out there and making connections that way and growing my personal local bitcoin dunbar number you know what i mean <laughs> yeah uh that that right there has been huge uh it's done a lot uh i know it sounds silly to people who might not understand the have been down the rabbit hole but bitcoin has changed my perspective on health i've become mm. so much more healthy uh and i feel so much better i'm i'm so much more productive respecting my own time having a lower time preference uh there's so many factors that lead into that. Is that about being more aware or? It's the proof of work. You know, you, you might see a good tip, a uh, health tip, more sleep or better nutrition or exercise or whatever, but like implementing those things and making them like default, you know, um, and, and, and making them all work together is kind of where that's all kind of come together in the last year or two. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, I talked about that in the last episode as well. It's really about w- walking the talk, basically. It really is, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's uh, that's I think big part of the of the Bitcoin ethos. So, um, I want to move on to my last question and I ask everyone the same same thing. What's a core belief that you will never let go? Good ideas don't require force. If we have to persuade that's one thing if we you know um educate that's obviously another thing but if we have to force somebody to do something even if we think it's good that doesn't mean that everybody else thinks it's good from their perspective and that force is just leads down a bad path it leads to more force and it leads to inverse force you know the, the reaction to force so if we can build a voluntary society it's unforced and that leads to prosperity um, wealth you know good times for all you know awesome man i love it um thanks so much for this conversation i really enjoyed it thank you and where can where can people follow you online i will link to your youtube yeah. and the, and the book thank you uh my personal is under or tim underscore niemeyer underscore uh history echoes bitcoin is on amazon uh it's at h i s t e c h o h i uh, b t c hist mm-hmm. echoes bitcoin and then uh the other stuff uh on youtube and twitter at uh zoom out 21 awesome man uh i hope people and, will, will check and it out and land bitcoin yeah so if you're around if you're in the <laughs> middle of a cornfield in the middle of uh, america yeah lincoln, lincoln land btc awesome Well, thanks again and uh, keep in touch. Thank you. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke. That's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.